I want to do today, yeah, come on in, uh, is I, I, this is workshop, so therefore this, this is really part of the practicality, I hope, of sort of the outworking of some of the other things. And in the afternoon, I think the intention is that there'll be some sort of illustrations and examples of the practice of uh, taking other areas and, and working them out and what they might look like. And so what, what we're going to look at or what I want to share with you this afternoon is something that I think has no claims to uniqueness. I want to say that there are no claims to uniqueness with this. Lots of people have started different things and similar things to this in, in, in ways as well. And this might just be, there might be things in the storyline or the narrative of how this has come about that might relate to you. Or there might be some things in the methodology of what we do that might help you. Or it may just be that it becomes for you something that starts the process of you thinking, well, you know, that might work or something like that might work. In a, in a context that you find yourself. I want to, you should have some notes if you've put this down as your, um, the, the area that you want to think about. And I want to look at this whole idea of translating vision into reality. And that's where I want to go this afternoon. Translating vision in, into reality. And I want to look first of all at the whole idea of vision. And that's only going to be a small part of what we think about. But I believe that's very important to have, you know, to say, how do I get a vision? You know, where does a vision come from? Because many people don't have a vision. You know when you listen to people speaking sometimes that they are passionless. You know, they can give you a kind of, a, they can explain it and you, you kind of feel as though it's a bit like somebody reading the news or something, but they're not really full of passion in this and you say, well, they're doing it, but you know, What's the motivation behind it? It's, there's got to be something more than that. And I'm, I believe that we should have a vision. And uh, I think that's important. So I have a few pointers here just as to where this vision has come from for me. And I think I'll uh, just put them up as they are. Finding our vision is uh, these are the things that I want to look, at, look with you just very briefly. Now, I'm thinking in particular here about apologetics and establishing something that has an apologetic ministry. And so therefore, when you think about developing an apologetic ministry, you have got to be a person who's connected in lots of ways, in lots of directions. No one will ever develop the passion for an apologetic ministry who lives in some sort of a, a spaceship somewhere floating or in some isolated place away from people and ideas and, and so forth. So you have to be uh, you know, you have to begin to start to engage. And I think, when I think about standing in the landscape of history, what I mean there is beginning to look at the flow of history as a Christian. Francis Schaeffer was one of those people who really uh, presented this argument, the flow of history. And as you start to read about the flow of history, you begin to see where you fit into the flow of history, and then you can also begin to predict where you think history is going. And that's quite a challenging thing. I mean, if somebody could say, do you know where things will be in the next 25 years in the church in your area or where things will be in the culture where you are in your particular country? And then you start to see the future. That's getting a vision. Because the future you see might look very wonderful. It might look very frightening. It might look very depressing. And if we're standing in the landscape of history, we look back and we can see lots of the events that have happened. We have now got, a, we've got the capacity to look back quite a distance and see big movements right from, say, after the record of Scripture, then into sort of the history of the church. We see lots of movements. We see things that were constructive and productive, and we see things that were destructive. We see times whenever the light of the gospel was all but extinguished in certain places, and then how, by the work of God's grace, it was reinvigorated again, and you can see that. And so standing in that landscape of history, you sort of say, you know, I, I'm beginning to get excited about what's going on here. Having a view of history as a Christian worldview of history as something that is linear, that's going somewhere, then you realize, well, you know, I'm part of history. And I can change history in the sense that I can be a, a, a person who can have an influence. I can begin to make a difference in my culture, in my area of my society. And 
Do you know, everybody can. And I believe the scripture teaches that every Christian ought to, and God has called us to be that part. So this idea of standing in the landscape of, of, of history means that we need to try to read history, read the history of the church, read the history of thought, not just Christian thought, but thought generally, because it's the thinking of society that has got us where we are today. It's the consequences of ideas, as has been said. So that's where that starts. Observing the reality of the church. What is the story of the church today? What are the challenges? What are the threats to the church? Do you feel threatened where you are? Do you feel in the society that you exist in that the doors are closing in your culture, in the culture that I'm in in Northern Ireland where I live and work and serve? Uh, I see a lot of change in the last 25 years. And having traveled widely throughout Central and Eastern Europe for 13 years, I now would say that in Central and Eastern Europe there are greater freedoms than there are in the United Kingdom. And, and so the landscape has changed. The church is, the, the, the story against which, against which the church is now living out and serving God in our context is very different. So I start to see things that make me stop and think, do you know, how are we going to reach this society here? And I begin to realize that we're not going to reach this society in all the normal methods. In fact, we're not also going to reach this society unless we equip people to reach this society. And the methodology that is operating in the last period of time in the culture, say, that we have been living in, which is Christian, inverted commas, is no longer appropriate in some ways. I know that would, you know, you might not agree with that, but I've been a pastor for 30 years in three different settings, culturally and locally in, in Ireland, and that's my experience. It, it has really changed. So these are understanding that, understanding things like the, the dualism and the fundamentalism, because to me that also is what I see in the church at times, this split between sacred and secular, and that's not and by any means uh, just in Northern Europe. I've seen that all throughout Europe as I've traveled. This split is there very clearly. And that's a great concern to me as I observe that. And so as you start to understand what's the reality of the church, there grows within your heart, I think, a concern. Now you can use the word vision or you can use the word concern or you can use a different word, whichever word you find is most appropriate. It may begin with a concern and it grows into a vision. And I think that's what happens. As I observe these things, I get concerned, I see it, I try to interpret it with the help of commentators, people who write, people like Mark Knoll, who's observed things, written some excellent work on the Christian mind, Francis Schaeffer, C.S. Lewis, Nancy Percy, all sorts of people who are observing and interpreting, and I listen to them. And that has begun to shape my thinking. And then living in the environment of Scripture, of course, is... Is, it, is, is that absolute that then helps us to be able to interpret. It's only through the window of Scripture that we have the capacity to interpret what's really going on in our culture and make an assessment, an analysis of it as something that's either good or it's bad or it's drifting or it's not or it's moving away from where it ought to be. So we can't do it without that. And uh, John Stott, he called this double listening. Uh, so that you are listening both to the to scripture and you're also listening to the to the the culture that you're living in. That's a good phrase. You're double listening, so that your concerns and your thoughts are being shaped both by the culture and by the Bible. And then, of course, for me, then finally, it is actually encountering the interface of culture. Uh, in First Chronicles twelve thirty two, there's that little phrase that you read there of the Ishakar, the men who had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. Men who had understanding of the times. Just that phrase, understanding of the times, the day in which they were living, the culture. And, you know, in a, in a, in a pietistic environment, environment which is sort of tens 
when it gets to an extreme to nearly withdraw in a monastic type of way from the culture. It's very hard to live in the interface of the culture. And so therefore you don't have the concerns. And people don't know. And you know, I'm not sure where your personal story is. I'd be interested to know what it's like where you are. But if I was to interview many of the people that I know here are Christians in my congregation and ask them about the events that are going on in the culture, and what is it like to live in certain parts of society? And they are usually from a reasonably middle class background. I think they would be totally ignorant. They would be shocked. In recent days, in the last few years, as a church, we have begun to build a lot more bridges into our, con into our community. What that's done is it, it has started now to, to see people coming across those bridges into the church. And there are lots of very dysfunctional people coming into the church now. On uh, the 8th of June, uh, we'll be receiving 23 new members into our congregation. But some of those people are very, very unformed Christians. And they have lots of problems and lots of issues and addictions and endless things. Now, that's going to create an interface of culture. <laughs> because they'll be sitting around some other people who just have not a clue about the culture that they're living in, but they need to. And then, of course, they have their questions. Because I am personally convinced that apologetics is not for the academy only, nor is it for an elite, nor is it for a certain type of person who's kind of uh, got an IQ of above a certain level, because everybody's asking questions. Because everybody's Everyday life is forcing the questions on them. And these folks that are coming into our church, some who have never been in a, a church in their lives before, and they're in their 50s, which is quite strange for some of our congregation to even contemplate, to think that there are such people exist. Because they have had this, this false understanding that everybody knows. Which, of course... That's one of the first things you discover in your interface with culture. You realize that the culture is so far away from the church. Understanding. We, our, our culture is, and so therefore, I, I'm only saying this is what is there in, in Northern Ireland, but I, you must place this in the context of your own culture, which may be different, very different. I fully appreciate that. But I think the principles here are the same. You might want to add a few more to that, because right, it's not exhaustive. But these are the sort of things that have been shaping the thinking that I've been experiencing over the years as I've been wrestling with this. So it's maybe time just for me to give you just a, a wee, a little bit, if I say we, that's an Irish terminology, a small little piece of biographical in here. The story, because a lot of these things are stories. You know, if, you, know, if, you, if you read about great movements in the history of the church, they, they are stories. You know, they're stories of people and stories of events and stories of of, of providences and meetings and so forth. And quite often it's the stories that people actually remember and all the principles they tend to forget. But you know, my story begins, I suppose, as I grew up in a family where my, I was, uh, my, my father and my grandfather had been Presbyterian ministers. But my father, after just several years as a pastor in the church, had an affair with one of the young women in the church, 20 years younger than him, and he left ministry and he left the family and I didn't meet him for another 40 years. I did meet him 40 years later through a providential miraculous occasion in the Czech Republic and that's actually quite bizarre but there you are that's another story and I can tell it to you afterwards but it's not really necessary for this but you know my mother then brought my sisters and I up she died when I was 10 years old so I was sent to a boarding school uh, which had some good Christian influences on the, within it, but it had many not Christian influences in it. And my very feeble and fragile faith of a 10-year-old soon uh, was sort of dissipated in the sweep of the, the world that I got into. And I became, in my teenage years, very cynical and very skeptical I mean, obviously, if your father's been a pastor and he's been unfaithful to your mother and your mother has died with a, an illness that has been largely caused through the stress of that, your attitude towards the Christian faith might not be exactly, you know, I'm a great fan of this. 
And so I was quite cynical about it, although I, by the grace of God, had met some very kind and very gracious Christians in the midst of that storyline. I'd also met some very unhelpful ones as well. So I have this, this sort of attitude of anger and also question. So if you present your case to me, I will definitely interrogate you as a young teenager. I'll not take anything for granted, but I would interrogate it. And, and so my coming to faith, coming to a real faith, uh, happened in the most dramatic way during the time when I'd, I, I'd been studying and uh, I'd got to go for a year to work, in a, to work in a management setting. And during that year, all I can say is that God was the hound of heaven in my life. I mean, it was, there's no other way. It was a traumatic, it was, it was very horrendous experience. It was one of those where I would have been shouting at the top of my voice at God when I was in some of the big units that we had and I was in a farming management situation. I used to go into the big, big buildings where all the animals were and you couldn't hear anything but the animals and I would sh just shout at God to leave me alone, to stop this disturbance in my life, whatever he was doing. But in, a, in his own gracious way, he, he didn't stop <laughs> shouting in my life. And so when I come to the point of surrendering, which really for me was like saying, that I give up. I think that's, that's how I describe, somebody said, What's, what is the prayer? Did you pray the prayer of faith? My prayer of faith was saying, Lord, you win. And I can still remember saying, you win. I have no idea. I didn't possess a Bible. I hadn't read a Bible from when I was 10 years old. I had a, no contact with church, but I had just this profound battle that had gone on, and I couldn't even formulate what Christian faith was about. I had no idea. So I knew I, that was where I came to. So I had to start to wrestle with all these questions then, and so a lot of it came about by being confronted by the church. It created so many questions in my mind, all this sort of behavior that I couldn't actually tie up with with what I was reading then as I began to read the Bible. And, and I, I was being exposed, I think, to the experience of nominalism as, uh, instead of reality. And so that sort of was the beginning then. I thankfully met a lot of good people in university. I started to read Francis Schaeffer. I started to read a lot of Christian books. I started to th get people who could answer my questions. And uh, I, I started to find these were satisfying answers to my, both my intellect and my soul. But I would have to say that that journey has continued. For I'm now 57 years old, and that journey is still ongoing. I, by no stretch of the imagination, have I got all the answers. When I started the serious search again about 15 years ago was when I started to engage in studying apologetics, informally, by and large, because I've been a pastor of a church, you don't have as much time to do all the extra study as you would like. In Northern Ireland, you don't have a big team like some other parts of the world. So you, you got to do everything that's there. Uh, it then began again, this whole dissonance, which if you're not prepared for dissonance, don't study, is my thinking. It's part of that living with the angst of knowing and not knowing, knowing in part, but not knowing fully, which is, of course, what the Bible says is going to be our experience. Now I know in part, and then I know fully. That is, that's, that's what we're meant to know. So. I then, one day, I simply pressed on, a, on, a, on the internet, I pushed on a button on uh, Zacharias Trust Summer School back in 2003. Just, I think it was at the corner of something else. And I pushed on that, and up came this, this page. It was the first year of the Oxford Summer School for the Zacharias Trust. And I just said, that sounds like something I'd really like to go to. And so I started, and I've been engaged with the Zacharias Trust ever since then, and uh, expanded in my, my, you know, my, my circles of uh, taking in more and more of the apologetic thinking and reading and so forth. So that sort of brings me up. Now, I'm not someone who's done a PhD in university. I've done my degrees, and I've been at two universities. I've done two different, uh, Queen's and the University of Ulster undergrad in uh, social science and environmental science, and my second was in theology when I went to Queen's but I haven't, therefore, got a whole lot of other list of degrees in areas of, say, philosophy and in apologetics, although there's a lot of philosophy and social science. So when it comes to thinking about then taking this vision that I have, seeing the culture that is confused, 
see in the church that seems to be speaking, but people can't understand it because they're not asking the questions. People are not asking the question to be explained in the, in the manner and methodology that some churches are saying, even my own, you know, and saying, people are so far away from, from the truth. I mean, they, they don't even know the Bible. They don't know the basics. And so many assumptions have been made about what people believe. So I'm thinking, how am I going to ever do this? And so I thought, well, let's try and teach people how to do it. Let's see what might happen. And so that leads me then to what I'll call the concept. Uh, and these are the five things that I just want to look at with you this afternoon. And if we, if we finish early, that's all right. I mean, we're not trying to fill the time. If I just go through this and then we can have some discussion, that's fine. The concept, uh, very simple. What is, what, what, is, what is our vision? What are we trying to achieve? For whom are we trying to achieve it and how? And uh, our concept is, and I've tried to put it in a, as brief, but is to, is to equip people. And I use the word people because I would be very happy to have people who do not know Christ come on our course. You don't need to be a Christian to come on our course. You just need to want to be somebody who wants to, who's willing to open your mind and engage with what we're going to try and teach. People to step across this gap. That's the gap that I see between the church and the culture. With faith, hope, and love, and confidence, carefully listening, which I think is crucial, perceptively questioning, which I think is also very, very important, able to bring adequate answers. That was the aim, is trying to do that. So what then is we establish Reality 316. Just to explain the name, there's nothing fancy about the name. Uh, people say, should it not be reality 315, as in 1 Peter 3.15, be ready, give an answer, and so on. I said, sorry, it's not. Uh, 3.16, they said, well, where's that from? I said, well, we have a building, and the building is called 316 House. When we, when we designed the, they redesigned this building, which had been the house where the pastor originally lived 150 years ago in our congregation, um, we were looking for a name, because it had been called the Old Man's Guest House been rented out, and I thought, what a terrible name, the old man. It spoke everything about how not to communicate. So we asked our congregation, can we get any ideas? And so the best one was, uh, the, it's number three, this, it's number three on the street, so we thought, somebody come up with 316. I thought, that's good. 316, I think I've heard of 316 somewhere. And so we actually, for our notice board, what we did was we took John 3.16 and we translated it into about 10 different languages and we just superimposed that along the back of the notice board. So we get lots of people coming up because we have quite a lot of tourists come to our area and, and various nationals who work there and they all come up and they're looking and you can see them point out there's their language and they begin to you know, twig it on and say, all oh, right, Japanese and various ones and Malays and Polish and all sorts. So it's great. So that's why we have 3.16. Reality is just simple because I believe that we want to help people live with reality. The reality is how Christians see the world. When I look at the world through the gospel window, I see reality. And I think when other people look at the world through whatever is their worldview, if it's not Christian, they don't see reality. They see something that's a perversion of it or a twisted version of it. And that's really the difference between us and Christians. For whom do we try to achieve it? Interdenominational? We are not, a, although I'm a Presbyterian minister, it's for anybody in any denomination and none. Intergenerational, it's for all ages. So you don't have to be a student. You can be a student. Uh, you can be a retired person. You can be an academic. We have had academics of the highest level come. Uh, that would frighten me, I have to confess, when I'm teaching. And uh, we have teachers and housewives and all sorts of people come. So it's intergenerational. And, and I think there's something really good about that. Because when you get, a, when you get a, an academic sitting with somebody who's like sort of whose daily work is maybe very menial and they discuss, I mean, that's tremendous because they have to learn to communicate in a way that they can each understand. And that's so good. Uh, and it's inter, and I can't, you could maybe think of the word for here, but I don't know how you put mixed ability in a nice way with an I O N N A L at the end. <laughs> that's a challenge, but mixed ability. So, in terms of academic capacity, we're happy to take people of a wide range. You need a basic understanding, but thankfully Northern Ireland has an excellent education system. 
and their level of education is, is very good and I think we're very blessed so that people come with a good basic education. How do we try to achieve it? The course has evolved. We're great believers in evolution when it comes to this. We really do believe in evolution here. We're Darwinians when it comes to the sort of education <laughs> in this sense. But it, it evolves as we listen. We started out and, and we began, I did a, a pilot course for this with young people, uh, sort of 17 year olds after school and thought let's run a little course for them and uh, I used what had been then called Wide Angle which was a course that the Centurions program in Charles Colson's organization had established and essentially it was just coming to a worldview looking at the four main worldview questions sort of like origin, fall, redemption and destiny or glory and so we took that as our model for year one and we tried to look at those four questions and hammer them out with people and then we began to realize that, you know, this, is, this becomes more and more restrictive. If you merely answer four questions, you eventually get to the point where you have nothing else to say. So we have then uh, started to change the way we do it, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the content so you'll have it. And there's nothing copyright about anything that we do. It's free. We do 36 hours of teaching from September to June, which is the equivalent of one module of a university degree. We do it over a period of Saturdays, seven Saturdays, which is seven training days supported by uh, workshops, seminars that meet in between those two. So that the work you do on the Saturday, whatever subjects you're covering, there'll be a very practical workshop on that about three weeks later. And uh, that happens in Belfast, that, which is more central for some people. And I go to the city to do that. We encourage mentorship where possible and where, where possible within where people can find someone within their own circle that we can then try and link them up with so that they do have an ongoing mentorship to discuss things with. But because we only take no more than 25 students, which is crucial, and we will be around this year, it's 21 students, um, we feel we can give them a lot of personal support so that they have direct contact with us. And there are four of us who are part of the uh, leadership teaching oversight of that. We do have an application process because we think that's important that people have got to think about this. It's, you know, you've got to go through the process of applying and in the application form you'll have to put down your, what you're reading, you know, your, your, your own story of Christian life. You'll have to put down your reading, what you've been reading, people who've influenced you. We want to try and understand the thinking that's going on in that person's life up to that point the areas they struggle with and types of things like that, with references and people who can affirm these things as well. Now what I want to do is give you the content. I put it up on the screen here for us. Rather than taking the ideas of uh, four, four main apologetic questions, and I know this is not unique to us, I realize, because since talking with other people that different, different colleges have a similar type of approach, but the, the thing about this is that we feel it's important that we wrestle this through ourselves. It had to become our own sort of approach. And you'll see at the top here we have knowing, thinking, seeing, analyzing, persuading, and engaging. And so rather than have these four questions, we've turned this into six areas so that one is uh, knowing, thinking, seeing, analyzing. So from each of those, you can then drop down, as it were, like a drop down, all sorts of different areas. So it, instead of it narrowing down, it actually starts to open out. So it begins to expand into all sorts of potential. And under the, all of those which are essentially trying to evaluate worldview, Christian worldview, we will then engage with the subject matter there. And you'll see those are uh, the last year and actually next year uh, is already down there. So that that's the series through for from September coming. And what we do is we'll take four areas each time and we will try to investigate those. And it runs on a two-year cycle so that if you take these two years together you'll have covered what we think is a substantial amount of the four main questions. But you'll have done it in maybe a slightly different way through uh, looking at different individuals Apologies, that's the seeing through the eyes of others, thinking. There you can see the sort of subjects we've been dealing with there. Christian mind, knowing, 
scripture to give us our biblical base for what we're doing. And then the whole idea of analyzing and persuading is all about uh, analyzing in the culture and different elements there and persuading individuals who have been persuaders, apologists, and then engaging. We look at lots of the areas that there are there, sexual ethics, medical ethics, and so forth. So it allows us to have the freedom and the creativity to sort of expand it out and involve and include other things. Each time we do one of these training days, we bring in an expert, someone we would call an expert, you know, who's got specific skills in that area, experience or understanding. And the whole idea is obviously, you know, to because we realize that among the four of us, we don't have all the skills, we are very limited. Some have a ex very expansive amount of ability, it can do a lot of things and others less. So it's, that, that's really the, the content of the course that we do. So, I mean, if you, you can have, we can discuss that afterwards. I mean, there's strengths and weaknesses in it. It's not perfect by any means. But the thing about this is that we are only at the end of our fourth year and we've been evolving this. And we most likely will alter things as we go along and we learn from the students. We take a lot of feedback from them after the, the year when they're finished. If you want to stop me any time you do, and uh, the community. Community is, uh, is a key component of what we're trying to do. Uh, those who are in the Advanced Apologetics Network know that every day I bring biscuits for our coffee time. And most likely, I, there was no other network that had the biscuits that we had every day, sweet things to eat to help create a sense of, you know, something extra. All the knowledge in the world will not make you wise. It'll just give you knowledge. It'll not make you an apologist. It'll not shape your character. In fact, it may actually damage your character. For we know how, as the Bible says, knowledge puffs up. And uh, it makes people sometimes very proud. And that's not a good thing. And the way that those character traits that are not good are changed is by working in relationship with other people. Relationships, as James, I think, says about what causes all these fightings and quarrelings among you, are um, relationships reveal your heart. That's why you fall out with people. That's why you live in relationship, because those relationships will reveal your anger, your impatience, your, your unkindness, all of that there. That's God's design. Uh, we live in community, and community reveals our hearts. And so community for us in this is that that's part of the whole thing. We want to try and create it so that relationships are at the heart of learning. Jesus in, in the training in the 12, and if you, did, you, you, you find that that's really helpful, there's a little help, very little helpful book there. I think I've given you that as one of the books to, well, I, well it was in my notes, I think. The training of the 12. By, um, I have a couple of quotations from it I might give you, but... Jesus uh, worked in community. He, that's the model, that's the, the, the model of his day of teaching. You took and you created a small community of people. And more and more, that's, of course, what the church is doing. It's creating small groups, it's creating accountability groups and uh, networking groups and so on. The idea is to create community. But community doesn't happen just because people happen to be in the one place. Like, we have a group here, but we're not a community yet. Now, we could become a little community once we, I stop talking. And you start talking and to each other. We start listening, we start learning, we start helping each other. We can start the process of community. And that community is about relationships between each other, the students, relationships between students and student and teacher. And it's very important that we're vulnerable in our teaching, which encourages inquiry and question and gives people the freedom to ask questions. We have to be very vulnerable, I think, as teachers, those who are involved in it. And I think if we want to help other people, I think we have to be vulnerable. Paul said that we don't only share the gospel, he said, we share our very selves. And uh, unless we are vulnerable, we'll not teach people very much. And we have some people who are brilliant in their capacity to transfer information, but their capacity to help change people is very limited because they don't share themselves. And I know some great academics, they could write great books, but they could not be a part of a community to really help to change people. And that's maybe just the way they're made. And praise God for them. 
and they may well be happy to work on their own and never see a soul. Computer, text, and everything else, that's marvelous. But if I think we want to get involved in this type of work, we have to be willing to be involved in community and to help to create it. So the formation of this community that we try to do is to involve time, and uh, that means the structure of our day, the way we do things, so we have enough time to be together, not just to learn, but also to sit around and eat. And food is very important. Um, that's why if you read Edith Schaeffer's book, Hidden Art, you can sort of grasp that idea of the importance that there are no small people and every person has an ability and every small thing is important. And that every small thing is a communication. I mean, the way you set a meal out to somebody isn't apologetic. I mean, you can invite people to come to your building and make it as spartan and sparse and uncreative. And what's that saying? You know, whereas I personally believe that you've got to, if we are to have the apologetic in everything, that it covers, it, it goes right through. It's like if you cut the apple, it's the whole way through. If you cut it, it's all the way through. So therefore, when people come, everything about us should be communicating this message. This, It should be Everything should be influenced by the gospel thoroughly. And now I know that people would maybe joke and say, do you mean there's a gospel meal? I'd say, absolutely, I believe there's a gospel meal. I think it's created by love to begin with. And it's served humbly and it's shared together and it's the best that you can afford. And we would not have any rubbish in our catering, I can tell you. <laughs> there are those here who can testify to that. Or... Uh, I mean, we believe that you've got to really give people the best, and I'm totally committed to that. And so uh, we do spend time and energy and effort to make sure that is case. It's important. Some of the students who come say, it'd be worth coming here just for the food. And, and that's good, you know, that's a good comment to get back. Um, I have feedback forms from some of them, and you're willing to read them. They're their own anonymous feedback, so you're better to listen to what the students say, and I'll throw them down the table and have a look, because they just did them there about the, the, at the end of the last one. So service is also important and while we, this is an area we want to work at, uh, we've been getting students to develop their own worldview questionnaires. Try to teach them that before you tell other people what you want them to believe, you have to help them try to understand what the other people believe. And to do that by developing their own worldview questionnaire that they can then take out and share and work together on. And We would like to do more of that where they have to go say uh, to Belfast, most likely, which is the biggest sort of urban center where we can engage with just people and do proper research. But they have to do it together. They have to think it out together and work in small groups and that. And we do a lot of small group work, but that's service. Time, service, and fellowship are all part of the community. So we're better doing less sometimes, but doing more time together. I would rather that and spend an extra year to do better quality, you know. And uh, it's maybe not a model that we can operate with at the uh, ELF, because <laughs> you've only got four days. <laughs> so it's, people want to get the maximum in. But when you're working with something like this, it's possible. Um, culturally critical. We try to be culturally critical in what we're doing I think an apologetics course that's not culturally critical isn't an apologetics course. It's really not. You know, it's possible to, to do to look at lots of areas of questions, textual questions, uh, to look at issues, moral issues, to look at lots of these things. But but unless we do it in the context of our culture, it's not really going to help equip people. And so the aim is to help students to be culturally critical, kind of watchmen and watchwomen of their own society. And that means we have to help them to understand the culture they live in, to understand their own presuppositions as well as the presuppositions of the culture that they live in. And in order to do that, we need to help each other be really good observers of our culture. And so we ask ourselves, where do you find, what can you observe in your culture? What do you look at? What do you observe in order to really understand it? And so you sort of think, well, where do I see my culture? What sort of things are like the, the access points or kind of like the windows into my culture? Things like um, 
we would imagine things like art. On the, maybe not at the top, but certainly art is there and is very accessible for some. Film, I think, is maybe one of the best. And so we think while we have reading lists, we also need film lists. Films are very important for helping people to understand their culture and to be able to critique those films, the worldviews that are found in those films, the worldviews that they're demonstrating are just the worldviews of the people in that society. The media, news, very important, very reflective culture. Uh, pop culture, the whole pop culture, music, literature, articles, internet culture, that, that's, that is the culture. And those are all very, very, very accessible. And so we embed all of that into the, the, so that our course, so that while you may have, as I say, a reading list, you'll also have a film list that goes along with that. And we'll also want to encourage people to give them little tasks to watch series, maybe. Certain series, series that you would find boring, you know, really not very interesting, but they are important because that is a reflection of a part of culture. So that the end towards this is that each student will develop their own apologetic toolkit. It's a kind of little terminology, just your own, I have a, I have a box on my computer, you know, like a folder, and it's called apologetic tool, toolkit. And I just keep throwing everything into that, you know, that I think is helpful. And I think everybody, you know, all Christians want to be developing and having their own apologetic toolkit so that they can work it out and, and, and wrestle with things and then put them in there and then articles and anything, illustrations, you know, whatever it may be, films you find and stick it all in there and then use it as a thing that can really help you. One thing we haven't done yet, but which I, I uh, listened to a lecture by Jerome Bars, uh, who is the Francis, who, the, who holds the Francis Schaeffer Chair in Covenant Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. He gets his students to write a letter to either a real friend or a fictitious friend but preferably a real friend who has a very differing worldview to their own, where they, they explain their worldview, not their Christian worldview, but their friend's worldview to them, and they do this over a process of time, and then he says, if you're brave enough, then eventually you should send it. And I think it's a wonderful idea. We haven't done it yet, but I think it's a creative way of getting people to understand the culture. And then, finally, uh, yeah, well... It's just really saying what I was trying to say scripturally, that we want to be watchmen in our culture to see what's happening. And then finally, that we want to be uh, challenges that we're having. Challenges are these. And, you know, I think there are, all, there are problems. We've made mistakes. It's not, I mean, it's not been easy. Uh, partnership is the first thing, and the partnership principle, I think, is very important. Early on in this process, I began by asking advice from individuals, uh, key individuals that I thought who would be able to, you know, give advice and steer you in the right direction. We weren't trying any sort of thing on our own to set up some little something of our own. We want to do something that really is useful to the church, listen to the church. And uh, so the local church is a very important part of our partnership. And I'm, because I, I've been pastor for 30 years. I'm absolutely passionate about local church, and, and I'm not so passionate about organizations that don't take into account that the local church exists. And there, there are some of them in the world, and I'm not so keen on that. And I think that the local church is there to be served. So that's a partnership I feel is important. Partnership with uh, other academic centers. So we have university professors from Queens and different University of Ulster. Uh, in our local setting, there are Christians who will come in and they will, uh, they will deliver some of the course for us. We have entered into partnership with the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics and some of their tutors will come across from time to time and have input into our course and they're there for us to uh, discuss with ideas and we share reading lists and things with them. And with other denominational uh, groups in, in Northern Ireland that we can engage with, the denominations that we can try to listen to them and see what they think and let them look at what we're doing and, and, and tell us if it really is something that's helpful. So we're open to criticism, we're open to advice, and, and we're open to counsel. And the partnership principle, I think, is very important. We couldn't do this unless we had the partnership of all these others. 
And, and the thing about partnership is if you're saying to yourself, I'd really love to do something like this, but I don't know how, the first thing I would say is look for one or two other partners who have the same vision as you have. And just talk and pray together and just start it. And even if it starts out poorly, don't worry. You can restart it. You know, you can always go again. Recruitment is a bit of a challenge. Staff is a challenge for us because obviously we don't have a big finance. You know, it's, we're not a big business. We don't have backers. We don't have anything. We had, we had nothing. <laughs> we started out at zero. Uh, all we could do was we found a, a room in the church that I'm in, and they were happy to let us have the room, although we still have to pay for heat and light and stuff in it, so we still have some expenses with it. So um, staffing, we were, the Lord brought together enough staff who were willing to do it for free, and they were willing to give it all volunteers, so everybody is there, and they, they're all committed to it. Um, recruitment, again, this can be quite a difficult thing, and you, you need to really think hard about this. How do you recruit students? And so what we've done is we've set up kind of parallel things. Uh, for example, we would now then uh, organize one or two other events where we'll bring people of a profile that will attract a lot of people. So last year we, we were doing it on the weekend of C.S. Lewis' anniversary of his death, which is the third weekend, November 22nd, 23rd November. And so we, we invited last year, we had John Lennox, who is here, he came and he did those two or three days with us and we built a lot of things around that and that really promotes what we're trying to do and puts it onto the big stage. Uh, this year we're, 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 we've talked to Dominic Smart, who's another minister from Scotland and he's willing to come and do something on the whole idea of, of flourishing, Christian flourishing. We, we want to look at that and again that creates the opportunity for us to engage with the wider community and then we can tell them about this. And so we organize events like that, and sometimes when we go out to speak on, a, on apologetic, and in, 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 we get invitations to speak, we will just then, people often come up, and lots of young people especially are really keen and say, where can we find out more about this, and where can we read about this, or just generally in apologetics, and we say, well, you know, this, is, this might be an option for you to come. Funding is, is a challenge. Uh, it's always a challenge because how do you make things pay? You know, cover itself, you know, because we pay for our experts who come in. So we, we have a cost per student per year of £200. Now, I don't know what that equates to where you are in your culture, but for us, that's very, very low level of costing because that includes everything. Um, and in comparable terms to other courses and colleges, it's really nothing. And students, we don't charge students at all. And if people are like working through, say, we have some of the relay workers of IFES, they, they come and we don't charge them. We just try and support the work they're trying to do. So that means that there's a variation in there for folks. Accreditation. Uh, for some people, accreditation is not that important. You know, like for many people, they just want to get skills. We have, you know, there are people who are, are they don't need any more accreditation. They've got plenty of degrees and qualifications already. But there are some people for whom accreditation would be important. And one or two of the colleges, uh, Union Theological College, the Theological Faculty of Queen's University, are quite willing to uh, discuss accreditation with us because they recognize that what we do is effectively two modules of a degree over those two years. And they'd be willing to recognize that. And we have to set up the formalities of that. But it's, it's something that can be helpful. But you need, for accreditation, you need people who are working in the world of academia to go through the process. But enough people, I think, have done it to steer others, and we're fortunate. Prayer and the future development, well, that's always a challenge. Developing a supportive prayer round is so important. Because although people wouldn't think of it, I really see apologetics as a cutting edge ministry. Sometimes think cutting edge ministries are people who are on the street corner and people who are maybe in countries where there's threat and risk. But to me, it's strategically cutting edge in that you're really trying to uh, interface with society. It is very, very important. And so we really do need support underneath that, prayer support, which is very important. And then the whole idea of your development, your, your former students, that's a very important part. So next year, uh, we have built into our year a residential to which we will invite our former students and then bring a special speaker to that. 
which is a kind of a way of reinvesting in our former students and also uh, adding a little bit more to the, to the development. Our next process, our next step in this journey is to start a summer school linked into this for students who are 18 plus either going to university or at university to be a real help to them. And we're working in partnership with IFES there, in partnership with Scripture Union and uh, one or two churches. So that's the next step as well. So I think it's always good in an event like this or a course to build in potential for development and think about it in those ways. So that's me finished. And uh, now it's open to questions and discussion.